pleasure to be able to present to you today. Uh, so my name is Omar Bayraktar. I'm a group leader at the Welcome Sanger Institute. And also joining me today, my co-pilot is Ibuka Kipchiolda. She's a senior bi imaging bioinformatician at the Biomage Archive and Embled AVI. And together, we'll tell you about visualizing integrated and uh, single cell and spatial transcriptomic data sets and you know, what kind of biology you can get out of uh, using these integrated approaches and what types of platforms one could use to access these data. So I'd like to start with the biology. Uh, so, you know, the promise of uh, integrated single cell spatial omics is really this high throughput systematic discovery of, you know, the cellular circuits of complex tissues. And by that, I mean, you know, the sort of the tissue units that different cell types give rise to by interacting with each other to, uh, to you know, perform certain spe or specific organ functions. And our lab and many others in the field have been approaching this roughly using these sort of like three steps. First, we could grab a piece of tissue. So, you know, this could be your sort of like healthy tissue that you're interested in or a diseased tissue. You could use single cell omics, put it into a blender, get a soup of single cells and nuclei, and read your transcriptomes and other modalities to be able to identify the cell types, the cell states, as well as their gene regulatory programs. Once you have this, to be able to identify where all these different cell types, all these different sort of parts of tissues fall uh, across tissue environments, you can reconstruct them using spatial transcriptomics. And today we'll tell you about sort of multiple different types of spatial transcriptomics. But, you know, the promise of this integrated approach is that you're able to spatially reconstruct the cellular transcriptome and other modalities. And that allows you to, for example, systematically look at cell-cell communication as diagrammed between a tumor microenvironment cell and a cancer cell and brain tumor here. So really sort of the takeaways for uh, today's seminar will be that this integrated approach where you put together the single cell and the spatial modalities builds better tissue atlases. It's much more informative. And we'll, I'll present to you a particular use case in brain tumor biology to exemplify that. But second, what's really pressing at the moment is to need to make these tissue atlases widely accessible to the research community. So there's as low of a barrier as possible to be able to navigate these data sets and share, share them with each other. And Ibuke and I will also tell you about you know, the web atlas and the bio image archive platforms to achieve this. Now, uh, before I sort of dive into the biology, I want to spend uh, uh, just a moment on the spatial omics part here. As you'll see throughout our presentation, uh, you know, spatial omics is uh, a growing collection of different type of technologies. Uh, there are many ways to classify spatial omics technologies, but a broad distinction that still holds is that they either sort of rely on imaging or sequencing for spatially profiling these transcriptomes. Uh, these methods are highly complementary with each other uh, with imaging-based spatial transcriptomics. So this includes methods like MRFISH, in-situ sequencing, or Xenium. You obtain a true single cell resolution by imaging. Uh, but the, you know, uh, the sort of like the con is that, you know, you're often limited to targeted gene panels, right? So and most of the work done in this field will be probing for a specific set of 100 to 1,000 genes on tissue samples. Very complementary with this are the sequencing-based spatial transcriptomic methods. So these enable, you know, these don't use sort of a small set of probes. They actually allow, uh, they actually either capture transcriptomes directly or they use very large sets of probes to enable this transcriptome-wide discovery. And the kind of disadvantages that most of the technologies out there, at least the ones that are commonly available, lack true single cell resolution. So throughout our seminar, you'll kind of see how these two different types of spatial omics modalities come together with single cell transcriptomics to build these types of integrated atlases. Uh, so uh, on my part, I'd like to start by telling you about a use case of multimodal cell atlasing uh, from our lab. Uh, so this is a largely unpublished work where we're trying to understand the biology of a particular brain tumor called glioblastoma. 
Uh, so we are interested in glioblastoma first and foremost in that it's the most malignant brain tumor. And at the moment, it's incurable, right? So the survival from this tumor, unfortunately, has not changed for many years. And, you know, most patients after diagnosis will survive over a little over a year. And part of the problem here in treating glioblastoma is that it has extensive tumor heterogeneity uh, through over a decade of work where all the different kind of omic from single cell to spatial profiling and or bulk to single cell has been applied to these tumors. We now understand that the malignant cells, the cancer cells in these tumors are actually quite complex. And they exist across a transcriptional spectrum that resembles different, you know, normal and aberrant human brain cell types as diagrammed here. And on top of it, this is not a static picture, you know, through animal experiments, you know, mouse model experiments, you know, uh, we know that these states actually show plasticity and they can transition from one another. Um, as I mentioned, this is really one of the best molecularly profiled solid tumors out there. There has been lots of cool papers. There's this really neat, I think, concept of, uh, you know, tumor cell plasticity, heterogeneity and plasticity. But at the end of the day, the picture we're looking at is a picture that we don't quite understand. And in particular, this heterogeneity is more of a roadblock for us to understand and treat these tumors and these, you know, uh, these diverse transcriptomic malignant cell states. Uh, we actually know very little about how they arise in these tumors, how all that heterogeneity comes to be, and whether these states relate to one another in a particular way. So my lab a few years ago uh, wanted to really take a crack at understanding the extent of tumor heterogeneity, how all these states come to be and how they relate to each other. And for this, with some generous support from the Welcome Lead program, we started a new multimodal atlas of glioblastoma called GBM space. Uh, so, you know, uh, as I mentioned, this is not the first molecular cell atlasing study of glioblastoma. But in our hands, we are able to do two things that are unique compared to previous efforts. First, these tumors are unfortunately quite large. Some of them could grow as large of a, as large as the size of an entire, you know, uh, or say half of a, you know, individual brain hemisphere. And you know what that means is that they are also regionally quite complex. So different parts of these tumors could show different biology. So in our hands, all the different profiling we did was actually applied to different parts of these tumors. And, you know, uh, one out of the 12 tumors we profiled was actually profiled in its entirety. So it's like a big whole tumor multimodal map that captures the intratumor regional heterogeneity. Second, you'll see that, you know, all these different technologies outlined here, you know, single nuclei, transcriptomic and chromatin accessibility sequencing, the sequencing-based visium spatial transcriptomics or the imaging-based visium spatial transcriptomics, they're quite complementary to each other. They uh, identify complementary biology, but given that these tumors could be quite different from each other from patient to patient or across different parts of these, it was quite important for us to be able to apply them to every single piece of tissue sample. So to enable that, we were able to grab these tumor tissue samples from these different sites, section them serially, and apply each of these technologies to every single, uh, every single piece of tissue. And that really enabled us to act, integrate them, and interpret them in an accurate way. Uh, so this is a big project, you know, we are hoping to be able to share it with the, some of the first results with the community quite soon. And throughout the past few years, we've been able to really study lots of different aspects of tumor biology, from the spatial organization uh, of cancer and tumor microenvironment cell states, to the cellular trajectory of the cancer cells, to their clonal organization, to the communication uh, between cancer and the tumor microenvironment cells, as well as the cell intrinsic gene regulatory networks. In the interest of time, and to sort of keep with the theme of this seminar series, I'll mainly be talking to you about the spatial organization of these tumors. So, as I showed at the beginning, we start with the single cell omics modality, which allows us to identify all the different cell states and all the different sort of parts of these tumors. 
And in our hands, uh, we generated this big single nuclei transcriptomic uh, data set of these tumors. Um, you know, when you look into the biological annotation of this data, you can see that we were able to capture all of the principal cell types that make up these tumors from the malignant cells into different flavors of tumor microenvironment cells from immune cells to vasculature to uh, neurons. And besides that, we were able to dig deep into the biology of each tumor and identify their fine grained subdivisions. Uh, in the interest of time, again, I'll just focus on the malignant cells today. Uh, as we sort of, you know, looked more and more into the biology of these malignant cells from this data set, we were able to identify that they came in four major flavors. Uh, so the first sort of two groups of these malignant cell states are those I'll describe as developmental progenitor-like. They molecularly resemble different types of, you know, progenitor cell types that you can run, it, that you can identify in the human brain and the normal human brain. Uh, the first group looked like oligodendrocyte progenitors. So these are, you know, pretty ubiquitous. You know, these are the progenitors to pretty ubiquitous, uh, you know, glial cells of the human brain. And, you know, they're thought to be sort of quite important as a potential sort of cell of origin into these tumors. And you can identify quite robustly that lots of malignant cells actually look like them molecularly. The second group of these progenitor-like states looked, uh, you know, distinctly like neuronal cells. Uh, so, you know, uh, the glioblastoma is a glial cell type like tumor. Uh, and, you know, unexpectedly, what we and others have been able to identify is that some of the malignant cells in these tumor actually mimic the sort of like the normal neurons that you identify in the brain. So it's quite interesting. And then the sort of the third major group of tumor cells, uh, malignant cells, looked like a, sort of a transcriptional spectrum. On one end, they looked like, you know, astrocyte cells. Again, this is a glial cell population that you would find in the normal brain. But then, you know, uh, we identified malignant cells that showed transcriptional hallmarks of what we describe as gliosis, which is a sort of a, a glial cell expressing injury response and mood healing programs, as well as hypoxia. And finally, you know, uh, from their transcriptomic profiles, we could see that a bunch of the other malignant cells were clearly proliferating. Now, you know, I can talk about sort of like the different gene expression programs of these different cancer cell states in quite a bit of detail. But one of the key things we wanted to understand was whether these different malignant cell states were spatially organized into tissues. And to be able to do that, we were able to leverage our integrated, uh, the integrated nature of our data set. So uh, again, we started with the single nuclei data. We were able to, from each patient, you know, get the transcriptomic profiles of these different malignant cell states. Then we were able to grab the sequencing-based Visium spatial transcriptomic data set of each patient, which again is this transcriptome-wide, you know, spatial profiles of uh, e thin tissue sections from each different part of tumor. Uh, again, you know, uh, while this modality or the sort of the previously available versions of these modality uh, give you that transcriptome wide profiles, one disadvantage is that their spatial resolution is not at single cell. And the version that we used in this uh, project had that 55 micron spatial resolution. So, certainly, sort of, you know, uh, each sort of uh, measurement or visium spot contains multiple cells. So to be able to sort of, you know, computationally deconvolve the cell type specific information here, we are able to grab the single nuclei data and use a probabilistic data integration framework that we developed a few years ago, cell to location, to infer the abundance of every individual cell state in every single piece of tissue or every single piece of visiting spot. And the result of that is what you're seeing here. So on the image on the left, you could see a visium section of a one particular part of a tumor from one patient. You know, so the pinkish bluish stuff in the background is the histology stain that allows us to orient uh, ourselves with the anatomy of these tumors. And then all these different spots are those 55 micron 
you know, uh, array locations that are spatially profiled. And then the different colors indicate, you know, different molecularly distinct subtypes of cancer cell states that were identified in this patient. Um, what you can see very clearly here, even in this small piece of tissue, these different flavors of, you know, gliosis hypoxia versus progenitor life cell states are actually spatially segregated with each other, which is really the first clue that there's quite a bit of spatial organization in these tumors. Now, to be able to really comprehensively investigate this, we wanted to quantify, you know, really the spatial patterns that we see from this type of analysis. And to be able to do that, we were able to quantitatively, you know, uh, we were able to calculate basically the co spatial co-localization of different flavors of cancer and tumor microenvironment cell states from this cell allocation analysis. So I'm happy to sort of go into detail in the Q&A session and how it's done. But basically, we start with the cell location results where we have integrated the single cell and the Visium profiles for each patient. And, you know, with the level of each patient, we first go about, uh, we perform, we first go about performing another round of deconvolution to measure which cell states are actually spatially co-localized, you know, for the rest of the presentation. I've described this Specially called localized cells as a tissue niche. And then finally, we can go about doing this for all of the in different patients in our data set and then seeing which of these tissue niches are preserved or, you know, across multiple patients. And when we did this, what you can see here is that across all of our patients, across all of our Visium data, we were able to identify a sort of a, a relatively small number, just a little over a dozen of tissue niches that first recur across all the different patients and second, have distinct malignant and tumor microenvironment cell state compositions, right? So this is really this is the second big clue that what we're looking at here was perhaps a type of spatial organization that recurs, that exists across different types, different tumors and different patients. The third sort and the final kind of clue on what these tumor niches are was really where they are located in the spatial data, right? So uh, all of this tissue niche quantification was done in the Visium spatial transcriptomics. So that gave us the ability to go back to the data and see where anatomically these different tissue niches lie. And when we did that, we saw really this stark anatomical organization of these niches where you know, they're organized across almost a singular axis between the sort of the healthy part of the brain that is being actively infiltrated by the growing tumor, which is called the infiltrated uh, cortex, that's marked by tissue niches of normal brain cell types, such as neurons. Uh, but then, you know, within the tumors, we find that there is, again, this sort of spatial arrangement of uh, developmental-like cell states or, you know, tissue niches dominated by developmental progenitor-like states being adjacent into these infiltration region, regions. And as you kind of go far and away from these infiltrated areas, you start seeing malignant tissue niches that are marked by this gliotic, you know, this injury response wound healing programs, as well as hypoxia. Again, you know, a big advantage of doing this type of mapping on Visium data is that we are able to precisely quantify the relationships between these niches. Uh, so what you're looking at here is us taking the 100 or so Visium tissue sections where we did this type of spatial niche mapping and then using a graph network, quantifying, you know, the spatial proximity relationships across these niches. And again, what you can sort of see here is this clear spatial organization of these different tumor niche components, where on one hand, you have the part of the, you have the healthy brain that is being actively infiltrated by the tumors where the tumors are expanding to, you know, uh, the tissue niches, the tumor tissue niches near those enrich for these developmental progenitor-like malignant cell states. And as you go farther and farther away from that, you start seeing these hypoxic necrotic sort of tumor niches pop up. Now, you know, all this analysis was done using this computational integration of the single cell and the Visium spatial transcriptomic data. So we were also quite keen to understand 
whether this type of spatial organization would be validated with orthogonal spatial transcriptomic modalities. And for this, we are able to use the Xenium assay, uh, which is a probe-based assay that allows us to sort of use this, you know, uh, probe-based detection coupled to imaging to measure, you know, these the both the molecular sort of identities of these tumor cells as well as their spatial relationships at single cell resolution. And what you can see here is really this Xenium assay applied to three different parts of a patient's tumor. And, you know, or the sort of the, the major spatial pattern of these different flavors of cancer cells that also emerges from this analysis is that no matter where you look in these tumors, you really see this stereotyped organization of developmental like cell states near the infiltrated cortical areas of tumor expansion. And then, you know, as you go farther and deeper into the tumor, that's where you see the gliosis and the hypoxia stuff pop up. Uh, so you may be able to put it together from all these arrows that I'm showing here, but, you know, all this sort of this meticulous and stereotyped spatial arrangement of the cancer cell states, you know, raise the possibility to us that they might be, that there might be a stereotyped cellular trajectory of malignant cells. Uh, you know, perhaps really what we're looking at here is not simply different flavors of malignant cells being compartmentalized into different tissue regions, but potentially a consistent molecular trajectory of tumor cells that go from these developmental-like cell states into gliosis and hypoxia that gives rise to this spatial organization. And luckily for us, we have the single nuclei data, the sort of transcriptome wide unbiased data set of these tumors where we could investigate that, right? So Again, being sort of inspired by the spatial organization, we were able to step back and go back into the single nuclei data and investigate the sort of the molecular, the transcriptional trajectories of these, you know, malignant cell states using, you know, uh, complex computational models. Uh, I'm very happy to go into detail uh, in the Q&A session, but for this task, we were able to grab, again, the single nuclei transcriptomic profiles of each patient, uh, we were able to actually divide these into individual tumor subclones as well to be able to study, you know, the malignant transitions at that level. And then, you know, to infer the cellular trajectories, we used a new probabilistic RNA velocity inference model that we developed uh, that we call Southgate. And what you're going to see here, where, you know, in these different, you know, in these plots where every row is a collection of cells from different parts, uh, a collection of cells from different patients in different tumor subclones, and the x-axis denotes sort of like the reconstructed temporal trajectory of cells, you can see that really the consistent dominant pattern here is that malignant cells are traveling from developmental like programs into gliosis and hypoxia. So, Wrapping this part, you know, uh, what you can see here is that this power of this integrated multimodal single cell and spatial profiling allowed us to really redefine the rules of these tumors and sort of re-describe their fundamental biology. What you can sort of see here is that there's a fun sort of a, across different tumors, there is a common spatial organization of tissue niches. These tissue niches are actually shaped by molecular transcriptomic transitions of these cancer cells. And, uh, you know, the dominant pattern that you see in terms of malignant cell trajectories is their journeys from developmental-like states into injury response and hypoxia. So all this taken together allows us to take these complex tumors and identify a spatiotemporal trajectory of malignant cells that underlies their cancer, underlines their tumor heterogeneity. Uh, so that's most of the biology that we'll talk to you about today. Uh, I'm going to switch gears at this point and sort of, you know, start talking about the sort of move on to the second part of our presentation, which is uh, we've generated all this data, we have identified all this biology, that's great, but how do we share these multimodal data sets with the research community, and how do we make sure that, you know, there is equitable access ac across the board to these multimodal data sets? The analogy that's used the most with this type of work is that, you know, when you kind of put 
single cell together with spatial transcriptomics, what you're really looking at is a Google Maps of human tissues, right? Where you can sort of pin down the spatial locations of molecularly distinct cell states. Uh, this is not just kind of like a corny analogy, right? This is actually something that could work quite practically. You could envision that a lot of the static images of visium or Xenium data result for cell types that I showed earlier could literally be accessed in a Google Maps type of browser, right? Um, however, to get there, there are particular challenges in the community. Sort of, you know, some of the two that we will highlight today is first, what we're talking about here is working with lots of different data types and modalities across single cell and spatial omics that are, you know, that have quite different specifications and they're often not web friendly. And second, you know, to be able to browse or share these different data sets, we need access to user-friendly platforms. So to sort of elaborate on these challenges, I'll now pass the floor to Ibike, who will tell you about FAIR data and how her team is trying to address them as part of the Biomage Archive. Yes, as Omar said, um, the FAIR data is the underlying um, data structure to be able to achieve these um, nice cell atlases, as well as many other scientific um, resource uh, that would help us to both visualize and analyze the data that the community has. So I'll tell about the FAIR data in the context of Biomage Archive and how we achieve it at the Biomage Archive. So first, a short introduction as to what Biomage Archive is. It's a free public archive at, that resides at the Embly BI. We store and distribute biological images and any related data. We accept submissions from any imaging modalities um, as long as these data are either published, so associated with a publication, or has a value beyond a single experiment, meaning it can be some valuable data set that is always used for training purposes, could be some um, prototyping, um, proof of concept type of experimental data set, and so on. Um, so let's move on what FAIR data is. It's like, it is what it is. Um, it's a equal to be uh, equity in um, data, but it is also an acronym, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So let's start with findable. What does it mean? It means your data obviously needs to sit somewhere on the internet, but like dumping it onto a Google Drive is not uh, necessarily a findable data. So it needs to be you know, searchable and um, it needs to have some sort of uh, accession or DOI or something that people can point to. So in this case, this is um, just a screenshot of um, the Bioimage Archive. The search term in here is brain and it also brings out related terms like the hippocampus and so on. And you can see we have um, essentially um, accessions for each of these submissions as well as we started doing DOIs. Uh, this, you can also do searches within the submissions, within the data sets. And in this case, um, for instance, there is treatment compound or like um, uh, information which you can search for within the this particular data set. So this is findable. Um, what is accessible? As I said, it needs to like it needs to have an address, and it also um, needs like different methodologies. For instance, we provide HTTP, FTP, and Globus access to download these data sets. Um, and we don't have any, um, you know, you don't need to have um, a paid, we are not a paid service and you don't need to create an account to um, access these data sets. These are all freely available public data sets essentially. And we provide the license information, which is another part of the accessible essentially. 
And most of the data sets we have are either CC0 or CC BY licenses, which means you can freely uh, reuse and CC BY would require um, referencing, but um, you can freely use the data sets uh, whichever way you like. Um, and then comes the interoperable part, which is the more problematic part, especially in the biological imaging and also the spatial uh, omics data world. More on the spatial part, on the imaging part, I would say, or like the combination part, as Omar mentioned. Um, so one of the problems is that there are lots of different data formats and including many propriety formats. And uh, which also means that you cannot, I mean, either X, um, like even if you download these data, you won't be able to use them because you, they are proprietary and require specialized software. Or it could be like, again, you know, um, you simply cannot visualize or analyze these uh, huge data sets without uh, downloading, which is um, one of the biggest challenges now that we have a larger and larger uh, sizes uh, of data. So as you can see in this little tab, it lists some of the different formats, um, file formats that we have, but this is just a small subset among like a hundred and uh, more than 150 essentially image formats that are um, relatively widely used. So to solve this, um, there are these file formats called the next generation file formats. They are chunked and they are like uh, pyramids, um, structured in pyramids, uh, which is like similar to Google Maps that uh, Omar mentioned, where you have like um, the original image with the highest resolution, but then you have um, different levels of the pyramids with lower resolution where you can uh, easily access because they are much smaller in size and but they give you a more like a uh, low resolution snapshot of the the actual thing and then if you want to get to the higher resolution you access to the specific chunk that you want and then get the high resolution image like in the the Google Maps zooming in um in a very fast and easy way so this is um essentially the um, the way of moving forward which uh, enables both visualization and analysis on the fly like we we do with the uh, spatial data um, we are um, so there is this format called OMIZAR uh, which we have started using at the biomage archive and it's widely supported um, by the imaging community. Um, it's a cloud optimized, cloud friendly format, which means you, know, you can, um, as I said, visual, both visualize and analyze this, these uh, data um, on the fly without needing to download it to your local computer or local servers. Um, and it supports many different type of uh, imaging data. So what we do at the Biomage Archive is essentially what we started to do, uh, and we are upscaling this, is we are taking the deposited images that are deposited in many different formats and converting them onto OMIZAR so that they can be accessed in a single data format standardized and cloud friendly, which will is one of the building blocks essentially um, for uh, visualization and analysis platforms like WebAtlas. Um, so we have started to showcase this, um, um, a new feature, um, introduced a new feature called galleries, where we have done this conversion to OMSR for some, um, like several of the data sets we have, uh, and where you can essentially um, as I said, click on the image and um, even though it's uh, like huge either in the megabytes or in terms of the number of pixels, you can easily see and you can see some basic information, for instance, in this case about the, the channels, 
you can view it with different browsers and so on. And then comes the reusable part, essentially, which is, okay, you have these very nice images in standardized format, but what are they, right? So that information comes with the metadata. So, okay, what, I mean, I have this image, but what am I looking at? In, in, so is this, what organism is this? What kind of sample um, is this? You know, how was it prepared? How was it imaged? What, I mean, you have some of these information here, for instance. So what we do in, at the Biomage Archive is we have implemented the REMBI metadata schema. REMBI stands for the recommended uh, metadata for biological images. This was the community coming together and um, throughout the discussions um, coming up with a metadata schema that tries to capture the, the necessary information to make sense of, of your uh, images and on your data in general. And this is what we have implemented at the Biomage Archive and um, essentially um, is what is the building block for reusability. And I think from now uh, on, I will hand back over to Omar because this is all nice. And um, we are doing some of this work for the image data, but it is even more complicated for spatial omics data uh, and uh, which requires uh, the specialized workforce and uh, uh, the, you will see the wonderful um, work done by the Web Atlas team now. So the next 10 minutes or so, uh, as we come to the now final part of our presentation, I'd like to tell you about, you know, uh, this new pipeline that we put out recently called Web Atlas that allows, you know, you to, uh, that allow you to visualize integrated single cell and spatial transcriptomic data on the web. So, you know, as IBK beautifully outlined, you know, uh, dealing with the different data modalities, uh, you know, making sure that you capture all the important metadata and making sure that you could sort of like put them out in a cloud friendly, you know, uh, accessible format uh, have been major challenges in this field. And Web Atlas really, you know, uh, aspires to sort of address these types of challenges. Uh, first off, this has been a wonderful collaboration with Moose Hanifa and is led by, you know, Tong, Dave, and Daniela, as you can see on this slide. And what Web Atlas is really is really two components. The first bit is dealing with the you know the diversity and the data types and uh, converting them into web friendly formats. So the really the heart of the pipeline is a data ingestion pipeline that unifies all these different single source spatial transcriptomic modalities. It runs as a Nextflow you know uh, it it runs on Nextflow. It is compatible with many different types of single cell and spatial transcriptomic technologies, including multiple types of sequencing and imaging based stuff. And what it does is that it grabs all the different components going from gene expression data to images to label cell masks, and it converts them into the, you know, the fair file format uh, that's optimized for cloud usage, the czar format, as I outlined. Uh, specifically for image-based spatial transcriptomics, uh, we wanted to make sure that all the different image data components were properly represented. So as part of Web Atlas, you're able to navigate not just the raw images in this multi-scale uh, pyramidal fashion, but you're all also able to access the segmentation, the cell segmentation label masks, as well as things like, for example, for uh, you know uh, transcriptomic methods, you know uh, RNA. Uh, RNA spots that are identified as points, the RNA molecules per each cell. The second component is making this interactable and visualizable on the web. And to be able to do this, we were able to, you know, adapt the wonderful web framework from the Gellenberg lab for single cell and spatial data. So this framework is called the TESS. 
uh, it's already uh, does quite a bit of the heavy lifting here because previously the Gallenberg lab and others had demonstrated that you can put different types of modalities into this and you could really navigate them in the Google Maps fashion, which you'll see in the next few slides. And in our hands, we simplified the Vitesse setup, but we also adapted it for fully coordinated browsing of integrated data sets. Now, what does that look like? Uh, so what you're looking at here is a multimodal data set that is placed onto Web Atlas. Uh, the image here is a snapshot of the Vitesse application window, which is literally a website that you will you know, log on to on your browser and all this stuff pops up. And what you can sort of see here in these different windows you can see for a different cell atlasing project that applied different uh, multiple modalities to the developing human limb, you can see both single cell imaging as well as sequencing based spatial transcriptomic modalities. These different consoles, as you'll see in the next slide, allow you to interactively query the expression patterns of genes or the cell types across all of these different modalities. So for example, you can come in here and you can sort of look for, you know, where a particular cell type such as cartilage progenitors, chondro progenitors lie. And what you can see here is that when you query for the cell type, it's, uh, you know, it's sort of a cluster in the single cell data set as well as spatial positions in the different spatial transcriptomic modalities pop up. In a similar way, you can also query the expression pattern of these genes. And here we were able to query one of the genes that are known to express in these chondrocyte progenitors. You can see where that expression is in the single cell data set, but more importantly, at the level of single cells or spots, you're able to also visualize them in the spatial data. Importantly, all this stuff is like interactive. So in this little video, you can see how one goes about interacting with the you know, web atlas. So in this first instance, we are zooming in and out of the spatial transcriptomic data sets. Uh, this works in that multi-scalar pyramidal manner, right? So as we zoom in, the higher resolution images are popping in. And now you can see uh, the query for a particular cell type. So we selected these chondrocyte progenitors and in yellow, you can see where they pop up. And you know, any really, any of the 60 cell types that were defined in this data set can be navigated in this manner. And again, one is able to, for example, zoom in to the imaging-based spatial transcriptomic data set, investigate where these cell types are exactly. Again, similarly, we are able to query for genes that show up in all the different modalities. And again, you know, uh, this type of querying uh, can be done for multiple modalities. We could sort of zoom in, for example, and investigate, you know, the expression patterns in the single cell data, you know, play with the different visualization parameters. And finally, what you can see here now is, you know, this is a very rich data set with 60 different cell types you know, coloring every single cell type based on their spatial locations. And last, you know, uh, as the, all the different image data components are accurately represented, uh, are represented in Web Atlas, you can see we can take away the segmentation mass and look at the raw microscopy images of a nuclear marker stain in blue and then RNA stains in, uh, in, in green, right? Now, with Web Atlas, we went to great lengths to be able to support, you know, the really the most common spatial technologies that are used by the community. So what you can see here, it's not just limited to the three that you saw on the previous slide, whether it's the sort of now commercially widely available Xenium and Merscope, you know, imaging based technologies, or it's the more bespoke Sackfish technology, you know, we are able to, we are able to support them and, Web Atlas pipeline. And finally, this is the kind of thing that scales really well, right? So there's certainly more work to do to push this into mega large atlases of hundreds of millions of cells. But to date, we can see good performance on single cell data sets with up to a million cells. And again, with spatial data sets, we were able to stress test it with the Murphish data set, which is quite large. And then with regards to RNA spots, you can also sort of go up to several million cells, uh, several million RNA molecules easily. Um, 
so, you know, at the beginning, I told you that, you know, our intention with the Web Atlas was to sort of democratize these data sets, right? We want to make sure that anyone could log on to, you know, like a, a Web Atlas portal and navigate these types of data. And indeed, if I were to pass you the web link that, you know, of any of these data sets, you're able to just put that into your uh into your web browser and immediately access it. And you can actually see these links, access these links on the on the manuscript. Uh, but there's a bit of a catch, right? To be able to run Web Atlas, you actually need some tech savvy, right? Because you need to be able to run the next flow pipeline. And to be able to address this, we are also able to generate a self-service portal. Uh, again, the link to this is included in the manuscript, but what this is, is just another website that you just log on to. Uh, at the moment, it's limited to a few modalities, but for your Visium or Xenium data sets, you're able to just simply drag and drop your files on there. And then, you know, the stuff that happens in the background, it uploads the data sets into our servers. We keep them for you for about a month. And at the end of it, you also get a shareable link that allows you to view and analyze your data in the fashion that you saw first. Uh, so, you know, if you're interested in trying it out, uh, do check out the paper and you can see the portal link there. Now, as we finish, you know, we'll uh, close by uh, uh, a couple slides in the future direction. So where is this field going? I think, you know, the progress in both the computational integration of these modalities, as well as the visualization tools and the, the presence of the repositories like the Viamage Archive are quite exciting. So really, I think one of the possible features out there is that these complex single cell spatial transcriptomic data sets can be increasingly deposited and well represented in the central repositories. Then you can have web platforms like the Web Atlas that can actually stream these data from these long-lived public repositories. And we can also envision, you know, in the future that this decentralized and flexible structure, which allows you to build your web platform whichever way you want while the data is kept in the repositories, can also progress into things like on-the-fly data analysis. And with that, I'll pass for a final time to IBK and talk about spatial transcriptomics in the repositories. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, yeah, so as Omar said, essentially, um, having to scale this up, we need public repositories. The current challenges for the spatial transcriptomics data in public repositories is that there is no one um, archive uh, repo for spatial omics data, um, which leads to either missing data because there are no clear instructions on where to submit your data, or there are complications due to linking data sets between different archives. Then there is the issue of missing or repeated metadata, again, in connection with the um, no um, clear sp um, home for these data. And then last but not least, as we just talked about, there is the issue of data formats and uh, bringing together the spatial and omics parts and uh, linking those two data. Uh, parts together. Um, so yeah, thank you. So what we have done um, with the Web Atlas as um, the Biomage Archive, we sort of we are acting like the um, backend to for some of the data sets and the Web Atlas portal. How we do this is that we got all the data. Um, the Web Atlas team has uh, submitted the data to the Biomage Archive, which is public, and one of the data sets are, is the screenshot you can see. You can also you know, go and um, have a look at it yourselves on the Biomage Archive page, although we obviously don't uh, provide this wonderful uh, visualization and analysis that Web Atlas does. Um, the, all the data is in this um, cloud-compatible chunked format, the OMIZAR and, and DataZAR um, formats. And then, um, and all the data is on the fast access S3 storage, which enables that uh, fast uh, Google Maps like zoom in and out and uh, link together uh, view of the data. This is how you get that wonderful analysis and visualization. And yeah, little acknowledgements. Obviously, Matthew Hartley is our team leader, and we have a growing team of people was behind this and uh, Eugis Sarkans is the biostudies team leader who is uh, 
um, which is we, we use their submission system at the moment. And on our side, I'll also acknowledge our wonderful collaborators who worked with us on the Web Atlas, including Musa Nifa's lab, Sarah Teichman's lab, the Open Microscopy team, as well as Sheila Kazanfar. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. And I think... Great. Uh, thank you very much, Omer and Ebuke, for the presentation today. And thanks, everyone, for, for joining in. And we have got a few questions already uh, in the chat box. I think the first question is uh, for Omer. Uh, does Web Atlas work for stereo sec data? Yes. So uh, there is no reason that it wouldn't. The uh, At the moment, it's not pipeline to do that because we did not find, you know, we wanted to focus on the the more common data modalities such as Visium or Murfish that are more widely available, but there's absolutely no reason from file format types to scalability that it would not work for StereoSeq. And if you kind of have your StereoSeq data already as an end data czar, it will go in or end data object, it will go in immediately. I think with StereoSeq, you know, different versions of the technology do or do not have image data. Again, there is absolutely no reason why they cannot come into the web atlas. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one is, are there any data sets free to explore uh, on the web atlas app? Absolutely. So, you know, my uh, colleague, Tong Lee, uh, who uh, nicely joined the chat, actually posted the link to our data portal, which lists access to, I think, over 20 different data sets, right? So, either there or also on the Web Atlas manuscript, which is available uh, both as a you know peer-reviewed copy as well as on BioArchive. You can see, find the links as well. Um, I think you know, one thing that we're quite, kind of quite excited to do is to sort of keep, uh, keep working with the Biomage Archive team to think about how we could expand you know, the number of those browsable data sets where, you know, you're free to explore not just the images, but also the gene expression. So, you know, uh, watch the space for more updates on that. Uh, next one is, uh, I think it's about the approach. Why did you begin with single cell analysis before moving to spatial transcriptomics? Would it be possible mm -hmm. to start with spatial transcriptomics, perhaps using digital mm -hmm. spatial profiling and then follow up with Xenium or MERS scope for cancer research study? Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, it's a good question. So, you know, in our workflows, we like starting with the modality that has sort of like the, in a way, kind of the best discovery potential, right? And while spatial methods are coming up quite quickly, I'd sort of still say that single cell, you know, the suspension-based single cell or single nucleiomic methods kind of give you this advantage that you combine true single cell resolution with transcriptome-wide detection. So what you kind of get out of there is not just, say, the identification of cell states based on known markers, but you also get access to lots and lots of other features of the cells that go from, say, transcriptomic trajectory programs to receptors on ligand gene expression that mediate cell-cell communication that may not be actually profiled by the, say, probe-based imaging spatial transcriptomic methods. Now, I think, you know, uh, there are a couple, you know, as these technologies are developing, I think there are uh, interesting uh, sort of like uh, sort of uh, new approaches and workflows are emerging. I think something that we find quite interesting is to work with the high resolution, like discovery-ish spatial transcriptomic modalities so Visium HD or StereoSeq would be one, for example. These are giving you full transcriptomes or, you know, the expression of 20,000 genes at really high resolution. At the moment, you still have to do a little bit of work to translate the those measurements into single cell spatial profiles because neither modality directly gives you single cell information. So you have to do a bit of analysis, such as segmenting cells from the images and assigning pixels transcriptomic pixels to them. Uh, or, you know, we're also quite interested with, you know, uh, as the, you know, uh, as the audience member uh, indicated, some of these imaging-based methods, and specifically those that look at lots and lots of genes, such as the 1,000-plex murfish or the 5,000-plex xenium. 
Uh, now, the very specific question, like starting with something like digital spatial profiling, you know, if it fits your biological question, I think you should start with whatever method. But when you kind of start with something like DSP, which gives you mostly coarse resolution, there's a bit of an information loss that you have to deal with, right? So you're not going to have that single cell gene expression type of starting point uh, where you can go all the different places. You're just going to say this part of the tissue expresses this gene. How do I interpret it? So always think about it, these things. Always think about what is the biological question that's most important to you and what is the combination of modalities that gets you there as quickly as possible. Uh, hi, thanks for the great talk. Is it possible to add histology image in addition to the nuclei or membrane stainings in imaging-based ST data on the Web Atlas app? Yes, absolutely. So if you mean by histology, if you mean the kind of the H&E stains, right, uh, you know, that is already kind of like enabled. So in this first instance, you know, we had in the imaging based ST data set, we didn't have the histology, but you can see the histology image in the Visium. So if you have a histology image available on your Murfish or Xenium data set, you can totally add it in. Okay, so the next one is, uh, there are a few spatial studies in glioblastoma. Can Web Atlas mm -hmm. be used to visualize those? Absolutely. And, you know, we are, you know, the sort of the, uh, again, you know, the those studies that have used, you know, these single cell spatial transcriptomic formats, they're already supported by Web Atlas, so they can immediately go. And as we look to share our findings from the first part of the talk, we are also quite keen to share our multimodal GBM data sets with the community as part of Web Atlas. And you'll sort of see, we'll kind of hope to sort of, uh, uh, you know, perform the, uh, hope to sort of apply the formula we had with the Biomage Archive where all the kind of, you know, uh, data sets will be stored in the archive long-term, but then Web Atlas will be streaming these data modalities for interactive uh, visualization. So can you help in plant research? You showed an example about the brain. If it is possible, is there any obstacles looking into plant sections? Um, absolutely. I, I think, you know, uh, again, you know, uh, Web Atlas is in ways uh, agnostic to the organism that you get the data out from, as long as, you know, it's one of the sort of modalities that we support now. Plants are, I think, you know, uh, many people may not know, but I think actually some of the earliest spatial transcriptomic work back in the day was done in plants where, you know, I think it was Phil Benfrey's team they able to grab Arabidopsis roots and sort of, you know, I think using LCM, uh, if I remember correctly, was able to profile different parts of the roots and do transcriptomics. And I think, you know, as with animals, plants have, you know, regional compartmentalization of different cell types. So different cells and different parts of the root, right, actually perform different functions. So there's need for spatial transcriptomics. Now, I think, you know, I, I'm i not too much up to date, unfortunately, on the plant applications, but I know I've seen, you know, uh, applications of imaging-based spatial transcriptomics like Murfish, I think, to plants. So I think there's no reason that it would not work. And if you're interested, please do check it out. All right. Thank you very much again, Omer and Abuke, for, for the presentation.